Welcome to RCR Wireless News. I'm Martha DeGrasse, and I'm here with James Kimry. He is Director of Wireless Research at National Instruments. James, mm -hmm. thanks so much for coming into the studio today. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, we're glad you could make it. So you just returned from the White House. National mm -hmm. Instruments is part of a federally funded wireless research initiative that was just announced a couple weeks ago. Can you tell right. us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, so the White House Office of Science, Office of Science and Technology Platforms, along with the uh, National Science, Science Foundation, they got together and they have announced this uh, POWER initiative. POWER stands for Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research. And the idea is to address this, uh, what they call the valley of death between academic research and commercial productization. And the way to do that is through prototypes. You know, taking this academic research and actually seeing it work in a real world setting, in real world scenarios. And what I think is unique about this, <coughs> this initiative, it's not you know, at, a, at a micro level. They're talking about building these test bids, what they call at scale, which means that campuses or even cities could uh, be test beds for, for these types of um, these types of research. And so, you know, four cities that right now, the idea is that <clears throat> there would be four cities that would be awarded these test beds to um, be the basis for all different types of uh, technology research and collaboration. Now, do you think Austin has a shot at being one of those cities since we're both Well, in absolutely, because there's, you know, AT&T Research um, is, is uh, is in Austin, National Instruments, of course. There's also the University of Texas, uh, which has uh, W. Um, it has the Wireless Research Center here as well. And then you know Texas A&M is close, and UT San Antonio has a research department. Rice. So we there's a there's a lot of collection of good collection of industry as well as academic university research that uh, could take advantage of, of a, a location like Austin. Okay, great. So cities are sort of bidding or trying to promote themselves to get these test bed opportunities? That's, well, that's correct. I mean, at this time frame, there's still a lot of education going on in terms of you know, how the programs are gonna be run, how the cities are gonna be chosen. Um, but the NSF has outlined you know, broad, broad strokes in terms of what types of things that they're looking for. A lot of, a lot of the goals and objectives are aligned with this thing called 5G, the next generation. Uh, but the NSF didn't want to limit it that. And the White House, they wanted to be able to make sure that these test bids actually live beyond 5G. So they're looking at more software-defined type platforms for the infrastructure. Do you think each test bed will have a slightly different focus? Yes, uh, I mean that's the idea is that uh, the researchers, both industry and academia, would work with the city officials. Um, you know, maybe there's something unique about a particular city in terms of their infrastructure or terrain, and then that would that would play into um, the type of proposal that they would develop for uh, a particular type of research. But I would I would expect you know, you know, technologies that have been discussed, millimeter wave, you know, massive MIMO. You know, into and to research topics like Internet of Things and Industrial Internet of Things. You know, those are all all topics that are of high interest right now. Okay. Okay. Great. And you personally lead a research group here in Austin that's been working on some of these technologies for several years now, right? I do. Uh, we call it the Lead User Program, and we've been uh, what was established in 2010, uh, 2010, and I have a, a small research team. And we work with uh, industry as well as academic researchers on developing prototypes. So, so this White House initiative really plays well with what we do at NI. And, and part of it is we, we, we saw a lot of the same things, is that the academic research in particular stopped with a research paper or it stopped with just simulation. And, and as, as you look at some of these 5G scenarios, they're very complex and, and simulation only gets you so far. The, you know, you have to have a good model and, and if you're trying to model uh, a million devices on a network or you know, 10 gigabits a second or more data rates along with um, you know, low latency, those are really challenging problems that I don't think that can be accurately described with the model. So we've been working with researchers to, to evolve the research and we've, we've worked with um, 
um, Nokia, University of Texas here uh, in Austin was one of our first lead user projects. Uh, we have projects in Asia as well as Europe, um, TU Dresden, as well as uh, um, Bristol University, Lynn University, you know, just all over. At any one time, we have about 20 to 25 projects that we're actively working on. Now, the Bristol University one got some attention yeah. last week. Yeah. They, uh, they had a, a nice video where they were excited about a 20-fold increase in spectral efficiency. Can you tell us a little bit more about sure, this? Sure, I would love to. So, uh, in the lead user program, we have uh, four, we call them the four vectors of 5G. These are research areas that, you know, we build platforms on and, and technology components that researchers can take, and it helps them build the, the prototypes a lot quicker. So uh, we have one vector that's on millimeter wave, we have one that's on massive MIMO, one that's on advanced wireless networks that's more on the upper layers of the protocol stack, and then we have one that's more uh, lower level, which is new waveforms and enhanced physical layers. And um, we've developed kind of systems for, for each of these. Now on the massive MIMO particularly, um, it's, it's interesting because it's a radical concept. A uh, typical base station that's deployed outside will have you know, six uh, antennas that are, that are sectorized, meaning they'll, they'll cover a 120 degree swath. And uh, Massive MIMO says, well, what if we put 100 antennas out there? for 120 degree or maybe even 180 degree. So you add the number, you increase the number of antennas and that allows you to focus the energy uh, to, toward a cell phone or a device and track it as it's moving. And now our, our systems are a little bit um, brain dead. They're not as smart because they just blast energy out there. So there's potential increases in or savings in terms of power. You're not blasting as much power. Even though you have more antennas, you're focusing that energy. And then you have this, uh, these uh, increases in what they call spectral efficiency, uh, meaning that you can get more bits per spe a given amount of spectrum than current technologies. And by focusing in the energy, you can, you can actually do that. So what uh, Bristol did, we worked actually with Lund University first, and they built the first 100 antenna massive MIMO prototype, which was amazing. It worked in real time, uplink and downlink. And then through this lead user program that we have, they were able to share the IP that they had created with Bristol University. And Bristol was really interested in the spectral efficiency piece. And uh, within I guess six months, less than six months, they were able to take uh, that code base and achieve 145 bits per second per hertz, uh, which is uh, over a 10x, almost a 20x increase in what the current LTE implementations today. So it was pretty exciting. It's a world record. How many antennas were they using? They used 128. Now, how many Antennas? Do you think an end-user device would have to have to take? Oh, advantage? in those in those scenarios, there were single single antenna configurations. And it still worked. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, conceptually, um, you know, the 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 idea of this beam forming and beam tracking actually works in both directions. But the idea is that you have the base station has all the processing, and it has a lot of the control in terms of being able to uh, pick out two users that might be closer together. We have actually better spectral re resolution uh, with all those antennas. So what adaptations at, at the smartphone level would be needed to take advantage of something like this down the road? Really, um, you know, different algorithms, different signal, signal processing physical layers. Uh, we had a, we had a, um, a project with Samsung mm -hmm. and that last year's NI Week, which was a FD MIMO, which is a, a similar concept to massive MIMO, and uh, the work that they did was on the UE device or okay. uh, user the smartphone, equipment, yeah. smartphone side, and they used our LiveView Communications application framework, uh, which is an LTE similar to what's deployed on a cell phone today, and they made just a few modifications uh, to demonstrate their concept. So that if that's somewhat of a proxy of what you would see with massive MIMO and the work that Bristol or Lind, Lind has done. I, I wouldn't think that it would be overly an overhaul of the standard by any means. I think it would be incremental in terms of the cell phones itself, themselves. Okay.
So you think it's a, a pretty fair bet that something related to massive MIMO would be part of the emerging 5G standard? Well, you can never tell. Yeah. Uh, but I think this opened, the, the work at Bristol opened a lot of people's eyes. Okay. And that uh, I don't know if people realize that those types of spectral efficiencies um, could be um, could be had or, or could be realized. And so, you know, spectrum below six gigahertz in the world, all around the world, it's, it's very scarce. And being able to take advantage of the, the spectrum that's there, you know, by employing techniques like massive MIMO, where you can increase the capacity or the, the data rates in a geographic region by 10x, 15x, I think that would have to be compelling to be included the standard at some level. Right, right. And then, of course, there's adding new spectrum, the millimeter wave spectrum, which you and I were talking about earlier. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, massive MIMO and millimeter wave get a lot of the attention yeah. because it really the radical breakthroughs, or not radical, but innovative breakthroughs in the last year or so. Uh, you know, and I worked with Nokia uh, to demonstrate some of the first really high peak data rate technologies in millimeter wave spectrum. Um, last year, or this year at Mobile World Congress, uh, Nokia and I de demonstrated a, a 15 gigabit per second link uh, at 73 gigahertz, which is, is, which is amazing. And uh, that was a two by two MIMO system. It was a massive MIMO, but it was a two by two MIMO system. And it shows the power of being able to go up to these higher frequencies where, where spectrum is, is really pretty, uh, it's not free, no, there's nothing free, but it's plentiful is the word. And, you know, and, and with the FCC now opening up or designating millimeter wave bands for 5G use, the United States became the first country in the world to have millimeter wave uh, spectrum designated for 5G. They have 28 gigahertz, 37, 39, and then they've opened up another seven gigahertz um, available for unlicensed, which is 64 to 71. So, I mean, in terms of, of what's available and being able to take advantage of it, um, you know, millimeter wave is, is certainly interesting. The challenges with millimeter wave are going to be more on the commercial side. Can, can these technologies be made feasible so they can be in smartphones or smart devices? And uh, can you uh, be able to deploy these cost effectively? So it sounds like millimeter wave and massive MIMO are are sort of maybe two parallel paths, or do you see them crossing at some point? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, I said there's uh, four, there's more than four research areas, but the four that we focus on, and uh, the waveforms and enhanced physical layer, uh, advanced networks, uh, massive MIMO and millimeter wave, those uh, four vectors. Uh, from a national interest pers perspective, they're they're not mutually exclusive. You know, I would definitely think that you would see these uh, definitely the advanced wireless networks being used with massive MIMO or millimeter wave, or having the enhanced uh, or new waveforms being used with any of these other technologies. So they're they're parallel in that you know researchers tend to focus. But it's at some level, at a system level, you can see these technologies coming together to really give us some really interesting results. Yeah, it is going to be interesting. Now, do you have any idea when we might hear about which four cities will be the test beds for these technologies? <clears throat> the timeline, I think, is uh, early next year. Early next year. Yeah, I think okay. uh, right now the framework is being set in terms of you know the governing boards uh, of the power initiative, you know who what people are going to be on the board along with the NSF and the White House, uh, OSTP, and then um, I think there will be some good goals and objectives in terms of, you know, what each uh, test bed, you know, what those goals are. And I think that will happen in the fall, and then there will be some education that will happen with uh, city representatives as well as industry. So it's still early, uh, but I do think the, the plans from the NSF, they'd like to have these test beds in place by mid next year. Okay. So a lot has to happen in a short amount of That's time. That's right, a lot. All right, anything else you want to update us on while you're here? Um, I think that's a lot. It actually. is a lot. <laughs> a lot to digest. <laughs> All right, James Kimry, National Instruments, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks, Martha. I appreciate it.